this video, we're going to talk about inverse relations and inverse functions. What happens when we reverse the coordinates of all the ordered pairs in relation? We obviously get another relation, as is another set of ordered pairs, but does it bear any resemblance to the original relation? If the relation happens to be a function, will the new relation also be a function? So again, when we're talking about relations, just, it's a set of ordered pairs. It's not so much always going to be a function. Now, we can get some idea of what happens by examining the examples 1 and 2. The ordered pairs in example 2 can be obtained by simply reversing the coordinates of the ordered pairs in example 1. This is because we set up example 2 by switching the parametric equations for x and y that we use in example 1. We say that the relation in example 2 is the inverse of the relation of example 1. Now, here's the definition of inverse relations. It's pretty important. The ordered pair AB is in a relation if and only if the ordered pair BA is in the inverse relation. Now, we're going to study the connection between a relation and its inverse. We'll be most interested in inverse relations that happen to be functions. Notice that the graph the inverse relation in example 2 fails the vertical line test, therefore it won't be a function. Now, can we predict this failure by considering the graph the original relation in example 7 or example 1? The figure 1.65 says we can. And that's down here. Now the inverse graph of figure 1.65b fails a vertical line test because two different line values have been paired to the same x value. Now remember the definition of a function. Every input can only have one output, meaning every x can only have one y. This is a direct consequence of the fact that the original relation of figure 1.65a paired two different x values with the same y value. The inverse graph fails the vertical line test precisely because the original graph fails the horizontal line test. This gives us a test for relations whose inverses are functions. Now that takes us straight to the horizontal line test. Now we all know the vertical line test says if it passes the vertical line test, then it's going to be a function. Now, in order to be an inverse, it needs to pass the horizontal line test also. So the inverse of a relation is a function if and only if each horizontal line intersects the graph of the original relation in, in at most one point. So if our function, if our graph passes the horizontal line test, the inverse will be a function. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to draw a horizontal line. I'm also going to draw a vertical line. Now it says which of these relations are functions. So what we're going to do, we're going to take our vertical line and go through. Well, looks like one's a function. Two definitely won't be a function because it does not pass over the vertical line test. Three also does not, is not going to be a function, it doesn't pass the vertical line test. But four is a function. So because it passes the vertical line test. So one and four are the answers there. Now, relations that have inverses that are functions. Now, it looks like one is one of those. It looks like two has the inverse that will be a function. Three will not work. Also, four will not work. So our answers to the second one are simply 1 and 2, passing the horizontal and vertical line test. Now, a function whose inverse is a function has a graph that passes both the horizontal and vertical line test, such as graph 1 in example 3. Such a function is 1 to 1. So on your project, when it says, is the function 1 to 1, it needs to pass the vertical and horizontal line test. So, here's the definition of an inverse function. If f is a one-to-one -one function with domain d and range r, then the inverse function of f, denoted f inverse, is the function with domain r and range d, defined by f inverse b equals a, if only if f of a equals b. It'll make more sense once we put numbers and equations to it. Now, finding the inverse function algebraically. Give the domain, including any restriction inherited from f. So here's what we're going to do. Now, in order to find the inverse function, it's actually really simple. I'm going to rewrite this as y equals x over x plus 1, just because we know that y equals f of x. 
what we have to do in order to start this, we need to switch our x and y. So x will equal y over y plus 1. Now in order to start solving this, we need to multiply both sides by y plus 1. Then distribute out. Now in order to make this easy, we need to take this term here over to the other side. So f of x equals y minus xy. Now you should notice that you can take out a y. Now our inverse function will be y equals x over 1 minus x when you divide by 1 minus x. Here's our inverse function. And really, if you want to switch it, this will be f inverse. So f to the negative 1 of x. f inverse of x will equal x over 1 over x. Now the domain will look just like this. Our domain x cannot equal 1. So it's all real numbers except 1. So we can go negative infinity to 1 in union with 1 to infinity. There's our domain. Now if we look at b, here's what we're going to have again. We'll end up with x equals 2y minus 3 over y plus 1. Do the same exact process. x times y plus 1 equals 2y minus 3, which means xy plus x will equal 2y minus 3. Bringing the xy term over and bring the 3 back the other way. So if x plus 3 equals 2y minus xy. And we're going to factor out a y here. And divide by 2 minus x. So our inverse function will be x plus 3 over 2 minus x. Now our domain will look like this. Our domain negative infinity of 2 in union with 2 to infinity. There's our domain of this function. Now let us candidly admit two things regarding example 4 before moving on to a graphical model for finding inverses. First, many functions are not one-to-one -one and so do not have inverse functions. Second, the algebra involved in finding inverse function in the matter of example 4 can be extremely difficult. We'll actually find very few inverses this way. As you'll learn in future chapters, we usually, we usually rely on understanding how f maps to x, maps x to y, and understand how f inverse maps y to x. Now, it is possible to use the graph of f to produce the graph of f inverse without doing any algebra at all, thanks to the following geometric reflection property. The points A, B, and B, A in the coordinate plane are symmetric with respect to line Y equals X. The points A, B, and B, A are reflections of each other across the line Y equals X. So if I had to find an inverse graphically, what I'd want to do is first draw the line Y equals X. There's line y equals x. Actually, I'm going to make it a little bit thinner so we can work it a little better. Now, I need to graph this and reflect it across line y equals x. So I know here's my intersection point. So it's going to look like this. It's going to come here and come close and then go right back out again. So there's that equation there. It's that simple. That's all that we have to do here. 
you're basically reflecting on one of Michael's axes. Now, do I expect to be perfect? No, but I do expect you to try to be as close and as careful as you can. Again, here's this part. It's going to come here. And there you have it. It's that simple to graph inverse of a function and reflect on line y equals x. Now there's a natural connection between inverses and function composition that gives further insight into what an inverse actually does. It undoes the action of the original function. This leads to the following rule. A function, is, a function f is one-to-one -one with an inverse function, g, if and only if f of g of x equals x, and g of f of x equals x. So in example 6, we're going to verify inverse functions by showing that f of g of x equals x and g of f of x equals x. So here we go. So if we find f of g of x, I know g of x equals the cube root of x minus 1. We're going to put that into the other equation. Now when we cube a cube root, we get the stuff underneath the cube root symbol. And that will give us equals x, because the 1 and negative 1 will cancel out. Now g of f of x will be g of x cubed plus 1, which will be the cube root of x cubed plus 1 minus 1 which will simplify to the cube root of x cubed, which will simply be x. Now for part b, I'd like you to stop your video at this time, try part b on your own, then start the video again. Now, after you're working on this for a while, you should realize that this actually is not that bad. We're going to change g of x to 4x minus 3. We're going to put that into the other equation. And you should see stuff drop out. The 3's will cancel out. We'll have 4x over 4, which is x. Now moving on to g of f of x, we'll have g of x plus 3 over 4, which means we'll have 4 times x plus 3 over 4 minus 3. The 4's will cancel. We're left with x plus 3 minus 3. The 3 and the negative 3 will cancel. We'll be left with x. So if you can verify that f of g of x equals x and g of f of x equals x, we shouldn't have an issue. Now some functions are so important that we need to study their integers or their inverses, even though they're not one to one. A good example is the square root function, which is the inverse of the squaring function. It is not the inverse of the entire squaring function because the full parabola fails a horizontal line test. Figure 1.70 shows that the function y equals the square root of x is really the inverse of a restricted domain version of y equals x squared defined only for x greater than or equal to zero. So we take a look at the graph of y equals x squared. That is not one to one because it passes only the vertical line test, not the horizontal line test. That shows in the second part here where the inverse of y equals x squared is not a function. You can see that. Now the graph of y equals the square of x is a function. The graph of the function whose inverse of y equals the square of x is shown to the right. And really that's just the right side of the parabola. Now, first things first, so when you're about to find an inverse algebraically, first determine that the function is one-to-one. -one. See if it passes the horizontal and vertical line tests. Then state any restrictions on the domain of the original function. Switch x and y in f of x, then resolve for y. You'll see here what we mean in example seven. 
Now, we need to find the inverse of f of x equals like square root of x plus 3. Well, we know the domain of square root of x plus 3 would be x greater than or equal to negative 3 because it's got to be greater than or equal to 0. Now, the range, that will be y greater than or equal to 0. Another way you can write this, what might make a little bit more sense, is if I go negative 3 to infinity. In the range, I can go 0 to infinity. And this actually should be a bracket here as well. Now, when we switch both x and y, we'll have x is equal to the square root of y plus 3. When that happens, we switch our domain and range. So our new domain will be 0 to infinity. And our new range will be negative 3 to infinity. So when you solve here, we'll have x squared equals y plus 3. Again, we're going to have the same domain, which means x squared minus 3 will be our inverse function. But it's going to have domain 0 to infinity. Now, if we were to graph this, and from before we found that if we if we graph square root of x plus 3, and then we reflect it over the line y equals x, then we put in here x squared minus 3, which is what we came up with. But we took away the less than x part. That will be your graph reflected over the one line y equals x. So this is the true inverse. Now for part b, again, I'd like you to stop the video. Try to find the inverse of the square root of x minus 6 on your own. Again, switching the domain and range. When you're finished, you can turn on the video. Now, the domain here of square root of x minus 6 will be 6 to infinity. My range, again, will be 0 to infinity. When you switch x and y, my domain and range switch. So I have x squared equals y minus 6, which means x squared plus 6 will equal y. So my inverse function in my domain will be 0 to infinity. Again, if you graph this, we'll just graph it here real quick. With x plus 6, it'll look something just like this. Now, what we're going to end up having, x plus 6 here, my original, sorry, I wrote my original wrong, my graph. It's going to look just like this. Your inverse then will look just like this, the line y plus x squared. So you can see that it is going to be reflecting over the line y equals x. Now, your job tonight is to go onto my Facebook page, Mr. Grovex Classes. Send me a personal message. All you have to put in your personal message is the mascot of my college, John Kerry University. Have a good night.